Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. Typically, on the episodes that we produce, we pull in people outside of Anabaptist Perspectives organization to talk about different issues. But for this episode, um, Marlon Summers and Regan Schrock, who are here on the interview, are both from Anabaptist Perspectives um, production staff. And what we're going to talk about today is mission work. Over the past, I guess ever since the beginning of Anabaptist Perspectives, we've had on a wide variety of missionaries and people involved in mission work to speak on our channel. And we've received a lot of feedback about that. A lot of it has been, it's been good to hear. People express that they have been encouraged and edified by what they've heard from the missionaries talking on our episodes. But there's also been a pretty significant voice of people who have offered critiques and criticisms of what we're advocating for and the kinds of things that we've been promoting through the interviews with missionaries. And so on this episode, we are going to engage with some of that feedback and respond to the criticism that we have received. One of the big things that came up in our in response to an interview that we did several months ago with Randall Graber, somebody who's working um, with the mission organization in Greece, we received comments on that video. And I just like to read them. And basically, the claim is that mission work is somehow intertwined with American politics. An individual named John left a comment, and he said, you can show you genuinely care for them by not going into their country and, dest and destabilizing the countries so we can steal their resources. This is a very backward way of being a missionary. The same individual left another comment in which he said, destabilize the region, send in missionaries, wonder why the people hate the USA. Newsflash, it's not because our freedoms. So again, in both of these comments, He's talking about the way that American politics and military conquest has somehow uh, benefited mission work, if I understand him correctly. So that's, that's one of the criticisms. Um, I guess the question to that is, what does American politics have to do with foreign mission work? Another thing that I'd like to bring up here just at the beginning, and then we can go back through and talk about each of these, is the issue that missions don't even work, and there's not a hope that, by whatever measure of success, the missions will be successful. A comment that reflects that came through YouTube. I'm not sure who left this comment, but somebody said, it's a joke to think that you'll convert a Muslim. So the question I guess I would ask about that is, what is the role of, as he said, conversion in foreign missions? And how does that factor into the success of missions? So there, there's two things that have come up here. One is the role of American politics in foreign missions. And the second question is, do missions even work? And is there some sort of success that we can you know, say, mm -hmm. this is a success that we can reasonably expect to happen mm -hmm. from our work? So maybe just in the response to the first question, let's just start by acknowledging that, yes, um, you know, large sections of the American church are way too tied to imperialistic American policy. And, you know, in our own Anabaptist circles as well, that's maybe limited a little bit by the fact that people do hold to non-resistance and so on, but there's still this, um, actually another of our production staff used this term in church yesterday, there's this kind of emotional investment in American politics, you know, even within our Anabaptist circles that, that does tie people back to those negative things um, that our first commenter referenced. Um, However, I think in my experience, it's the people often who actually are attempting to spread the gospel or make disciples in other part of the world who um, are best positioned to push back against those tendencies in the church. So I'm not sure that it's fair to blame those attitudes on quote-unquote missionaries. I'm sure many of them take those attitudes, um, but 
that's also a good source of pushback against American um, kind of arrogance in home churches. Yeah, Americans, interesting, because, you know, I've been around the world a few times and things. Uh, Americans do have this, this cultural supremacy mindset that's very interesting. Um, we're used, so used to thinking we have all the answers. Um, and one of the things the church has going for it, the Church of Jesus, is that we can say, well, no, we our particular culture that we're in, which right now we're in America, does not actually have the answers. It just does not. You know who, who actually has the answers? It's Jesus, and it's Jesus' people, and it's his kingdom, and it's people living out every day what it looks like to live with Jesus as king. That's where the real answers are, the real solutions. So when we get all, like you are saying, this almost emotional attachment to American politics, and we came through a really interesting election you know, a few months ago, um, I think we all kind of saw that, where it's almost like, oh, this is so either so good or so bad that my particular whoever I thought would be best for Christianity didn't get in, and it was just this devastation. And I was just had to think, wow, like we are, we the church should be so divorced from that because we're following King Jesus. That's the real solution, not our particular culture or whatever. I think the one of the keys here. This person mentioned the Middle East um, specifically. You know, one of the things we have as Anabaptists, we can look at what has happened in the Middle East, whether it was the U.S. invasion, which is the most recent in Iraq, two thousand three, or. Um, the British invasion a uh, hundred years before, or the Ottoman imperialistic expansions, or you take your pick. There, there's been a ton of different empires through there. All through that history, the Anabaptist people have never been a part of that, have never condoned that violence, have never been okay with that. Instead, they've said, here's the real solution. What you guys are doing is not the actual solution. Worldly empires are going to do what they're going to do, and that's kind of just how it works, I guess. I mean, it's earthly empires, right? God's people are, are way above that. Um, and, you know, particularly for us, again, in America, the whole U.S. invasion of Iraq, yeah, it tends to get Christians politicized on one side or the other, thinking this was right or this was wrong or whatever. God's people should not stoop that low because the solutions don't, aren't about earthly empires going and killing bad guys or whatever you think they may be doing. Um, Really, at the end of the day, God's people should be doing what God's people have always done, which is bringing redemption to this world. Um, I, I think that's how I would answer that person. In a way, he's, he's actually got a point. The U.S. has done some things that have been very, really not, not good for some people. <laughs> you know, They may have been good for the U.S., but they weren't good for, say, people in Iraq or Afghanistan. But that's, that's, not, really our, like that, that's not why we're here. We're here to bring redemption. I don't know if that's – maybe that even makes it more complicated. No, that's that's really good, and that's where we need to be. And yes, I think the Anabaptist tradition has provided some good, um, generally a good testimony along those lines, um, with obvious weaknesses, um, yes. obvious places in our history where um, we lost some of that focus in different groups, and you know, quite frankly, right now is also a kind of a crisis time for a lot of Anabaptist churches where a lot of that is I hope it's not being thrown out but with some of the reactions especially in the last year it feels like some of that's in danger of being thrown out and we got to really come back and strengthen it. Maybe for a bit of a summary mm -hmm. what you're pointing out Reagan is that America has done some very problematic things and the way that it's negotiated with military and political power mm -hmm. in the Middle East. But you would say that it's incorrect to associate that with what the American missionaries are doing, particularly mm -hmm. the missionaries who do have a proper prioritization of the kingdom of God, which mm -hmm. takes precedence over any loyalty to the United States. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to confuse the issues there. Yeah, that, that's the ideal. Now, we're all humans. Does that mean we actually live up to it? Pro probably not. You know, I mean, when I travel around the world, I am carrying an American passport. I'm using American money. Okay. I, I can't ever, you know, and that's okay. I'm, I'm a citizen of this country. That's, that's how it is. But if I go into, say, Iraq or Afghanistan and be like, America was awesome and like we killed a bunch of bad guys and this is great and, you know, yay, I'm going to wave an American flag. Obviously, that's a problem. You know, that's for one thing. 
what is that saying? It's saying the real solutions come from earthly kingdoms doing what they always do. And and the church, I believe the church shouldn't believe that that's the case. You know, the church isn't here to do that. Um, doesn't matter what passport you're on. And I think that that when I was when we were going through this before, and I was just jotting some notes down, the point I really want people to get away from this episode or bring away is the, the church is universal. You know, it's not tied to your particular country. Um, I've been in some places where you're, you know, with, you know, people from all over the world and, and they're all working together to, you know, help start a school for children who can't go to school or provide aid for people who need food. And it had absolutely nothing to do with what passports we were carrying. It was like, we're, we're all here because we're believers in Jesus and we want to help people. And, and, and that's very hard because, it, you know, we live in this country. So we automatically have some, you know, things about our country baked into our worldview. And, and that's not necessarily wrong. It's just be aware of it and understand this is so much bigger than yourself or your particular country. Um, one other thing, practically speaking, I hope the audience remembers, you know, America is literally 4% of the global population, 4%. Like, we're about this big when it comes to the sense of the entire world. Um, there's a lot more going on out there outside of our country. Um, and that means 4%. That means there's a lot of Christians, followers of Jesus, that are not part of our country. Um, and that's a beautiful thing, and we should embrace that. That's another thing to think about with the modern missionary movement that's a blessing is how really global mm. it is. I mean, some of us still think some of us still have in, you know, in the back of our minds the stereotype, oh, it's you know, first Europe sending them out and then Americans huh. sending out missionaries. But mm-hmm. um, this is really global. Um, the U.S. is actually a major target for missionaries from other countries <laughs> coming to do mission work um, yep. in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And similarly, there's, there's missionary streams all around from culture to culture. Um, there's the Chinese major movement of Chinese Christians um, working their way into the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Another one that I think is a nice example is I know somebody whose you know, goal is to disciple people um, in an Islamic country. Um, and, okay, my friends are American citizens. They came from the U.S., uh, but the organization that they're working under that's giving them direction mm-hmm. is an African organization. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a beautiful illustration of, okay, yes, there is this unholy, idolatrous link up between some of the American church and American foreign policy, uh, but there's a whole lot more going on. Maybe we should come back to a related issue here, mm-hmm. and that is I suspect that some of some of this pushback is probably not just complaints about oh missionaries are linking up with governments and policies um I, there's probably some who feel that well, I know there's lots of people who feel that you know the very enterprise itself that says oh we want to go to other countries and get people to embrace Christianity, to follow Jesus, rather than whatever God or gods they worship, um, that that itself is kind of objectionable cultural imperialism or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I wonder if it wouldn't be good for us to step into that a little bit. It will also help kind of transition us to that second question about Mm -hmm. why do you think you're going to convert anybody? So, uh, yeah, how would you respond to that person who says, I think this is ridiculous? Because I think that was on an interview we had done with someone working with refugees or so, something to that effect. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, interesting. Um, what do you think of that terminology, though? So I'm not sure where to go with terminology. I do think we talk about conversion. We should qualify the terms there. Um, you know, as that's used in the world, it's often used simply as switch religions or belief systems and maybe switch a whole culture with it. Um, you know, if we want to use that as a Christian idea, it should be the idea that when a person becomes a follower of Jesus through discipleship, the idea of conversion is a lot changes. Mm-hmm. It's bringing the life of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus in instead of what was there. 
I think that's the side that we know that we mean. Uh, if we talk about conversion as Christians, but culturally conversion is often seen as just get people to make the external switch, mm -hmm. convert at the point of the sword, accept baptism, whatever. Um, so I don't know that we should have a lot tied into that word convert. Um, like Reagan, you were saying before the show, something mm -hmm. like focus on that word discipleship, um, learning from Jesus. I'm not sure if when this person says something about converting Muslims or, some, you know, I, yeah, I'm not sure if I quite agree with that terminology. I think there's a better way of, of mentioning it. Like when, we, when we're saying mission work or, or you know, working cross-culturally, say, this is not, should not be about a particular culture coming and saying, you need to be like us, um, which is something, you know, that, that the church hasn't always done very good at, you know, where we have this almost savior complex, if you're going to, you have to be like us to improve your situation. Um, instead, I think w using terminology from the book of Acts, here is the way, like the way of Jesus. Here's where we're walking. Here's, you know, here's something, if you want to join, you can be a part of this, but this isn't like back in the day, you know, crusade style, you know, convert at the point of the sword, well, you know, we'll kill you if you don't believe like us. That is not what we're trying to do here at all. But, you know, if you look at a country like Yemen or Syria, you know, there, there are some real difficult challenges there. And there are people there who don't like the systems that are in place and would like to find something different for their lives, whether that's a different religion or a different thought process, whatever. That, that's not the point here. What we're saying is here is the way of Jesus, and you can join it if you like. We're not here to, again, that whole word convert just it brings a whole lot of connotations with it that, that I don't think we want. Um, people often think of that as, oh, okay, then that means you're changing all their lifestyle and ruining their culture and changing all this stuff and messing up these people who never wanted to be changed to begin with. And, and that's, not what I, that's not what the church should be doing. Um, the church is out there, you know, saying, Here, here's the way of Jesus. You can join it if you like, but it's not that we're making people come to a certain belief system. And one thing we should emphasize here is some of the offense is going to be simply, you know, stumbling over the claims of the gospel or of Jesus. Like Jesus does mm -hmm. make universal claims, mm -hmm. um, both about who he is, that he's to be worshipped and no one else is to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. And then there are ethical things that come from that or righteousness. How do we live the way? So... Yes, we are saying that everyone in the whole world should give up worshiping idols. Um, but, you know, that also cuts to American culture, too. Like, mm -hmm. everyone should give up the pistol under your pillow, unless you live in bear country and you're thinking about wild animals. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're thinking about people, you should. Every one of you give that up, mm -hmm. no matter what your culture. So. There is the claim that Jesus' kingdom is for all cultures, and some people are going to react just to that and label that in itself imperialistic. Um, and we can't back down from those universal claims of Jesus. Yeah, but at the same time, we're, we're just out there offering this and showing people this, but that's it. You know, instead of the, when we think of imperialism, is very invasive. Um, you know, British imperialism, American imperialism, whatever, where they would come in and just be like, hey, you're, you're changing, you're going to be like us, and that's just the way it is. Um, the church doesn't do that, you know, or at least it shouldn't. You know, there have been times in the past where it has, I, I, I suppose, or, or you could claim maybe that that wasn't actual Christianity, however you want to look at it. Um, that's, not what, that's not what Jesus is about. Right. The application of force to get people to line up mm -hmm. is a huge problem. Or coercion of any kind. Coercion yeah. of any kind, right. And the second thing that is a big problem that we've been touched on is, often this is subconscious, but identifying that universal claims of Jesus with mm -hmm. some things that are really far more culturally specific that makes yeah. missionaries tend to mm -hmm. undermine culture. And that's a task for really anyone who wants to spread the gospel is to kind of sort out, okay, how do I understand the difference between some culturally specific things, my way of thinking, and genuine 
teachings. I mean, even, you know, something as simple as the different ways that cultures look at time. Um, you know, Americans, for the most part, you have an appointment at a certain time, you better meet it. And we view that as part of respecting other people and keeping our word and so on. And in fact, in America, it probably is. Um, but you don't have to import that to another culture and say, oh, well, if they truly were followers of Jesus, they would adopt the standard of starting meetings exactly on time. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have other ways in that culture of respecting people and keeping your word and not letting people down that are different. Mm -hmm. thing maybe just to say about what's important for somebody who, you know, missionary itself can be a bad term yeah, because of cultural baggage and so on. Um, but somebody who wants to do discipleship cross-culturally, discipling people to Jesus. Um, you know, one concern is that people do things because people go in incompetently, naively, mess up things. Um, so doing it right is important. Not that you, you know, wait to go until you got everything perfect and you come in as a savior. Because mm -hmm. coming in as the savior is not the right thing to do. Um, but sometimes there's very specific technical training you need, um, other kinds of preparation before you go, and then just entering the culture with a lot of humility and asking questions first to understand where you're going before you start bringing everything into it. So what I hear y'all doing is painting a picture where mission work can be done, done well, the Jesus way. Talking about things like voluntary, not involving coercion, not importing culture and demanding that others comply. But something, something that bothers me is that I think all of these things could be in place, yet mission work could still go terribly, terribly wrong. And something that made an impression on me quite a bit is in the last couple of months, I listened to a podcast series by iHeartRadio called The Missionary. And it it follows the story of a woman named Renee Bach who operated a charitable treatment center in, a, in Uganda where she tried to um, serve children who were facing severe malnourishment. Mm -hmm. And a lawsuit came out of this, and the allegations tied up with this lawsuit was that 105 children died within her care. Mm. So it appears, and like, whether or not this is true, I'm not trying to make any claim, you can go listen to the, the Missionary podcast, and also I think several other news media companies cover the story, so you can go look for yourself. But from the appearance of it, while trying to do good, and trying to be the proper kind of missionary, she ended up doing a tremendous amount of harm, or at least facilitating it. And those in our audience from conservative Mennonite churches will probably recognize a serious thing that came out a couple years ago where there was a missionary within one of our organizations who went to the, missionary, the mission field and ended up doing a tremendous amount of harm, recognizing all these pitfalls, the possibility of just drastically misunderstanding a culture or having white savior complex or... It can be a lot of different things. Neglecting good that needs to be done within our home communities instead of expending a tremendous amount of energy going to other cultures, people to whom we are less responsible. Mm -hmm. how, do we see, how do we see mission work as even justifiable, understanding all the many ways that mission work can go wrong and often has gone terribly wrong? So on a very practical note, you know, this, what you're mentioning here about Renee Bach, um, so she goes and starts a clinic without any medical degree, medical license, um, medical experience really and and this is something she had she said herself didn't really have this but it's like well how hard can it be you know um, that kind of attitude is is uh, very obviously wrong you know we shouldn't have that I mean you, you're just because it's a nation more poor than you um, you know you, you can't do that there, there's a level of preparation if you're going somewhere to help people you need to be offering them something specific that that is a way of empowering them themselves so if you want to go to a certain country maybe you could go you know get an engineering degree and help them learn a, a form of engineering that they may not be aware of or you know like something useful something skillful that you have trained in and are equipped to actually 
tackle that. Um, in this case, you know, and whether the allegations are completely true or not, it, it doesn't really matter because it ruined her witness and, and it was not a good situation. She didn't go through the proper channels. You know, she didn't actually take the time to get the training to learn how to do something well and use that to help empower the people she was there to serve. So if you're there to serve people, your best option is to empower them and teach them and um, help them along their way instead of you coming in and just swooping in and giving a solution and getting some nice pictures for Instagram. Yeah, that, that's a, actually a real thing in, in missions. You know, people will go for two weeks and yay, they'll go build a school for these poor children in whatever country and get some nice photos for social media. And it's like, um, well, wait a second. Now we could have saved an enormous amount of money hired some people in that country who maybe need a job and told them to build a school. You know, why don't we think of doing that? Instead, we're going to fly a whole bunch of short-termers that don't have a clue the culture they're entering in so they can have a nice cross-cultural experience, I guess. There's some real practical things here that, that you know, organizations doing this really need to face and to take a hard, long look. Why are we actually doing these certain things? Is this even helping or empowering the people we're here to serve? Like, and if it's not, you, you need to get out. <laughs> You know, why else are you there? Um, you know, it, it, this is a real problem um, with humanitarian aid groups, not just Christians, um, but just in general. There's a documentary called Poverty Incorporated, where humanitarian aid becomes big business, where if there's not a disaster happening somewhere in the world, they start losing money. So it's like you need to find you know, some way of coming in and giving aid to people so you can keep operating as an organization. And then it quickly devolves from being a way of helping people to a way of um, making yourself look good. And, and like you said, white savior complex. This is real stuff, and I sure hope this hasn't happened to people watching this, but it's very, very easy to do. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've seen it firsthand in a lot of different places, actually. and it's, it's quite sad. I don't know, Marlon, what do you think? Yeah, I was thinking a variety of things there while you're talking. Um, hey, first on that training point, you know, she didn't have the proper training and it really came back to bite. And I think that can be a weakness in our Anabaptist circles in particular. We're so used to doing stuff small scale, you figure it out, you wing it, which depending what you're doing works mm -hmm. great. Um, but then that attitude comes across or like, oh no, we don't need certifications. We don't need regulations, we can just move faster without red tape. You know, we start to play that line. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's very real skills skills that need to be learned. Yeah. And certifications, if they're the right certifications, are designed to actually make sure you have those skills. Mm -hmm. And it's important to honor that. And in fact, in some countries, and this goes with being culturally flexible, in some cultures, those certificate certifications are a lot more important than they are here. Mm -hmm. And that's something we should honor in that culture as well. And and on a practical note, like because I think most of our audience is probably Mennonite or some some form of that culture, you know, we have a high emphasis on things like agriculture, building, construction, things like that. Let's say you want to do a, a mission trip where you go and, and you know build a school somewhere or something. You would not send a whole bunch of office workers to do that job. We inherently know, hey, you're going to want some guys on that team that have some construction experience. So like we know that about practical hands-on thing. Or you wouldn't turn somebody like me loose and say, go plant a garden and, and teach these people agriculture. That would be terrible. Go get the you know Amish farmer down the road. He's got, he has a lot of life skills, experience. He knows that field. So we intuitively know that when it comes to agriculture, construction, whatever. But what about like medical or engineering or you know um, teaching English? Um, all of a sudden, like, oh, no, those, those you know, we, there tends to be, like you're saying, that attitude, well, that's not quite as important. We'll just kind of go in and wing it. Um, but, you know, we, we understand it in certain fields, but in other fields, it doesn't quite click. And, and that's something, again, we needed to address and think that through. And I think it's more a blind spot than some deep set, you know, issue of white savior complex. Probably not that. But, it, um, hey, you know, maybe you should go to college for four years, learn some skills on how to teach English well, and then, you know, go to that country and teach in a university. Um, sure, but don't just go in and start winging it. We use the term white savior complex mm -hmm. a couple times. Perhaps as an alternative to that, if that would be advice, the proper way to look at ourselves would be with proper humility and understanding 
our own limitations and enough mm -hmm. self awareness and reflection to know the kind of biases that we're bringing into our desire to help others, and also to be aware of our own need to develop and to learn, learn from the people that we're serving, and to be properly equipped rather than just enthusiastic and ambitious and assuming that we already have the solutions to problems that we perceive others to have. Yeah, solutions to problems are, are often much more nuanced than we think. Like we'll walk into a foreign country and be like, oh my goodness, like, can't they have, you know, whatever thing we have in America that maybe they don't have, they should, they should just fix that. It can't be that hard. You know, actually, like, it's probably a little more complicated because if it was that easy, somebody probably would have done it. You know, I mean, like, they, they have brains too. Like, I'm, I'm sure they've thought about it. And, you know, there's probably a limitation here you're, you're not aware of. I think a really good motto to keep in mind in all of these things, something to the effect, you could say it a number of different ways, but just people helping other people. That, that's, that's who we are. You know, we're just normal human beings. Maybe we have a specific skill set. You know, again, Mennonites, we're really good at building stuff. We, you know, we have a lot of people in our circles that know how to build houses well. I'm not one of them. Don't have me go on a trip to help somebody build something. You know, it's going to be a disaster because that's not my skill set. Um, and that's okay to understand the strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, I was in Liberia last year and doing some video work for an organization there that is an entirely Liberian organization. They're, they're run by the local people who are there helping people. It's just people helping people. But they didn't have anyone on their team with good video skill sets. I had some family connections like, hey, you should come over and see the work. And why don't you bring some cameras along? We'll make some videos. So yes, I'll go over there. I have a particular skill set that they needed. Great. So I'll do that. I'll serve them. I'm helping them. But you know, will I go over there and run the school for them? Uh, no, because they, they know the culture. They understand so many things there that I could never, they, they will do so much better than me. So we go with the sense of I'm empowering and helping. You know, I'll do my part. But they, they've they, they figured out how to do a lot of it. Like, they don't need me to come in and, and fix certain things. You know, I'll go do my part that I may have a sp specific skill in that maybe someone on their team doesn't have. But that's it. That's all, you know. And, and, and as Americans, again, we tend to, tend to think, oh, we can just come in and, you know, take care of stuff. And that's, that's not really true most times. And like you mentioned with the video thing, you know, there is a place for cross-cultural skills mm -hmm. and what we talk about is community development and so on mm -hmm. and it's not that you know we're better than the people we're helping there but it's maybe we're able to have certain skills um, sometimes it just takes an outside perspective on a situation mm -hmm. which means that you know we as Americans should be open to people coming from other countries and giving us an outside perspective <laughs> on how we could do yep. things better, right? This should go both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes just the fact that you have economic connections, mm -hmm. if you go in humbly and using your skills right, um, those can be economic connections that are important mm -hmm. because oftentimes it is an underdeveloped economy or the economy was ruined by war or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having a foreigner who comes in with the right attitude can actually be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants disciples and worshipers from every nation, which means every ethnic group. And you can't give up on that just because things have often been done wrong. Mm -hmm. And obviously some things have worked. I mean, we think of China and Africa as missionary destinations because they were that not so very long ago. But in fact, you know, both of those places are major missionary senders now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are or have been in recent decades American churches that have had to put themselves under African leadership because the church was so bad in America. Um, so, yeah. yeah, there are things that have worked. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just that the missionaries accomplished everything, but somebody had to go to plant seeds that then grew or Christianity grew in those cultures. Well, thank you, Marlon and Reagan, for responding to the questions that we received. Mm -hmm. Actually, there were more criticisms, but we appreciate both the criticisms and the comments and the questions that you and our audience send to us. We are grateful for the feedback. This is the end of this episode, but thank you for joining us, and we look forward to having you back for the next episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. Mm -hmm.